Well, good morning, folks. It's good to see you all gather out. It's good to hear that buzz uh, around the place, uh, as always. Um, Sometimes you feel you shouldn't be standing up here to stop that buzz, because it's just good. It's good to hear it. You'll get a chance to talk to each other in a minute or two, of course, won't you? Uh, When you know when I'm finished, but it's good uh, to see you all gather out. Whether, well, I'll do my wee thing, whether you're here for the first time, the odd time, or every time, it's good to have you with us here Uh, as we worship God together. And of course, uh, there is a special welcome if you're visiting with us, and of course, a special welcome to family and friends of Catherine here as we come uh, today uh, to celebrate the sacrament of of baptism uh, together. It's a wonderful thing uh, we do as God's family uh, to receive our children into that family. You'll have received a copy of the announcement sheet on the way in. Uh, As always, there's uh, plenty of things there, just one or two things I want to highlight on your announcements, there is an announcement uh, for parent and toddler group uh, on Wednesday. Uh, There is no parent and toddler group. Um, That's finished for for Christmas. And you'll notice the change of date for the fellowship group there as well. It is on this Tuesday. If you were waiting for it last Tuesday, obviously you've missed it. Um, But it's it's on this Tuesday uh, at uh, 2.30 in 4 Woodford Avenue, so don't forget about that either. There's an announcement on the back of the sheets there all to do with uh, our Christmas services. Uh, We meet next Sunday morning for a Christmas family service when a number of the organizations and the Sunday school and so on uh, will be taking part, so it will be good uh, if you can join us for that um, and enjoy uh, as we celebrate uh, together. Then Sunday evening uh, is our carol service. I know it says carols by candlelight, and we've still to work that one out. Um, Worried about setting curtains on fire and stuff, but we'll work something out. And then, of course, uh, our Christmas Day service at 10.30 here. Now, I have to mention the Christmas Day service. I know we normally do. You normally have a a Christmas jumper day, uh, and we try and all wear a Christmas jumper. Um, But if you've noticed, uh, if you've been following on Facebook, you'll have noticed a little announcement about the Christmas Day service, and it said there's going to be a prize for the most outrageous outfit on the day. Now, those who were here at the Christmas dinner last night... (laughs) Um, seen the mild side of me. Um, if, you, if you thought that was outrageous last night, you've only seen the mild side of me. Uh, so I have got my outrageous outfit for Sunday, uh, for Christmas morning. So there's the, there's the challenge for you. Try and think up what's the most outrageous thing your minister would wear on Christmas morning, and then go another step above that. Um, I don't know how you will, but I, I'm, I'm determined to get the prize on Christmas Day, is all I'm going to say. But it would be great to come out on Christmas Day and, and celebrate together with, uh, on such a, a joyful day for us all. Mentioned last night, I want to thank all who were involved in the, the Christmas dinner last night. I think we had a, a good night's crack all, all around. Uh, to Herbie and the family for cooking the dinner and, and serving it to us. Uh, for all who were involved, Mark and, and his crew for the entertainment and the games. Um, Pat for her poems, and of course there were a number of special visitors there as well. A couple of, I was going to say a couple of wee elves, but I've seen somebody comment on Facebook that the elf wasn't that small. <laughs> um, but um, with a couple of dancing elves and Santa and all there, so it was a good evening I had by all. And of course there, there was some money raised. It was £725 raised towards the building fund, which was, which was fantastic uh, as well. <coughs> You may have seen on the way in, there's a table at the back there uh, with the little coasters, the slate coasters and so on that have be, are being sold to do with the, uh, the building fund as well. Now, we're not, um, we're not going to open a shop on a Sunday, but they're there if you want to have a little look at them. They're not for sale today. Uh, they have been on sale for some time, but if you haven't seen them, they're there. Have a little look at them and speak to Christine after the service, uh, and she'll sort you out uh, with that. An announcement here to do with, with Exodus as well. The Exodus Ball uh, will take place on the 28th of December and all young people are invited uh, to that ball. It's a meal in the white horse and it's £28 uh, for that. If you're interested, uh, contact Holly uh, if you uh, want to go to that. And also the, the Exodus teams are now live. Uh, they are online, um, but if you want any further information, uh, speak to Aaron or, or to Holly. Uh, to do with that uh, as well. 
There's an announcement in our sheets to do with the daily bread, uh, daily readings. If you'd like to receive those readings, to contact all of. Um, but I have brought a few uh, today. We encourage each other to do these daily readings, and, and we talk about the importance of it. Um, but of course, it's important to start that early. So you might have seen them on the way in, but there are a number of, of our daily bread readings for kids. It's a special 14-day Christmas one. Uh, there's some of them out there. I have some more in the months if we run out. But can I encourage you uh, to take them? It takes you through the Christmas story uh, to read with your children. 14 short uh, readings for children. Uh, so they're out there. They're free. Uh, if I was in Balamina, they'd be out the door already to get them. Um, they are free. Just take one. If you know somebody could benefit from it, um, please take one uh, with you. Flowers today uh, have been put on uh, by Jess and Ronnie Taylor. And of course, as always, uh, we uh, welcome all those who will be listening to this service uh, through the means of CD or our internet ministry. Right. Is that all or have I forgot anything? I haven't forgot anything. Good. I have a tendency to forget some announcements. Try and write down as much as I can. We come uh, to worship God today, of course, and to lead us into our worship. I want to read a few verses uh, from First Timothy. Uh, just to get our, our focus uh, right as such, we are here to celebrate Christmas. And it is good uh, that we celebrate and focus on Jesus' birth. But of course, it goes way beyond that, doesn't it? And uh, Timothy here reminds us of the whole purpose of Christmas in a sense really. He said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and worship God as we come to our first piece of praise. Come and sing the Christmas story. Let's join in worship together. Let's just still ourselves and unite our hearts in prayer as we come uh, to worship God together. Let's, let's pray. 
Our Father God, as we come this time of year focused on Christmas and all the different celebrations and so on, surely it does our hearts and our souls good to be reminded about what is at the, the heart of it all. That helpless babe in the manger, helpless babe, but a baby that gave up all the glory and majesty that was his and came down to earth and entered into our fallen world. Not to be served like the imperfect human kings and authorities, but to serve and to set an example of a perfect, sinless life for us to follow. Father, we thank you that not only did Jesus come as that helpless babe, as that perfect, sinless human being, we thank you that he came as your sinless sacrifice that we might live. Live life in all its fullness. And that redeemed and restored relationship with you. And Father, especially at this time of year, as we think about, well, what we've called that helpless baby, we pray that you would help us focus not just on the baby, but on his ultimate purpose for coming down to walk amongst us. That in all your almighty and sovereign will, our king whose hands flung stars into the sky are now scarred and sacrificed for us. As we look around us in joy and wonder at the different Christmas decorations and trees and so on, Father, help us to remember the the tree that Jesus was prepared to come and to die on for our salvation. So, Father, we pray that as we worship you here today, that we would hear your call to follow him and to serve you, that we would hear your voice speaking very clearly in each of our souls, calling us, to come to you, to give our lives to you, to live for you each and every day, that living sacrifice for your glory. So we, we do ask now, our Father, that you would help each and every one of us. Lord, help us as we sing our songs of praise, as we Listen to your word as we pray to you. Help us to learn how to serve you better, how to serve each other better, how to to love, to follow, and to serve you each day of our lives. So, Father, speak to us, teach us, and bless us in this time as we come to worship you, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're going to turn to our scripture reading for uh, today. It's a reading you will no doubt have maybe already heard uh, this Christmas season, and you will uh, very surely hear it a time or two uh, as well before Christmas is over. We're going to read from Luke chapter 2, uh, from verse 8 through to 20. Uh, It's the story of the shepherds, and we'll be thinking about their story uh, later on together. Uh, It's found in page 1027, if you have one of the the, the church Bibles with you there, uh, if you lifted one on the way in, but if not, Luke chapter 2, reading from verse 8. Let's read God's Word uh, together. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, 
and on earth peace on those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby. He was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Amen. We thank God uh, for his word and trust that he will speak to us uh, through it uh, as we look at that together uh, later on. We now have, the, as we say, the privilege uh, of the sacrament of baptism being shared amongst us here uh, uh, this morning. And as we come uh, to that, we're going to stand, we're going to sing uh, the first two verses of our baptismal hymn, Our Children, Lord, in Faith and Prayer. If the young folk want to come up to the front, um, of course, uh, there's no uh, children's talk today because we're doing this, but they're more than welcome to come up uh, and uh, watch the, 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 the sacrament being performed. Uh, and then we'll, we'll maybe get the wee box of sweets out after it. But as long as you leave Sarah and David and Catherine enough room to get up, and come on over this way a wee bit. Slide over this way a wee bit. Come on over here. Because that's a very important place over there. But we're going to stand. We're going to sing first. We're going to sing two verses of our hymn. Let's all stand and let's sing the first two verses of this hymn together. Children, Lord, in faith and prayer. Congregation, just take a seat. You can sit down for a wee minute. You only have to wait a minute or two before we get to the box, all right? Uh, Because we have something very important to do here. This is very, very important for the life of of our our church family here. And you're just going to have to stand there for a wee while, David. I'm sorry. Before uh, we actually get to the sacrament of baptism, I think it's always good. Uh, that we have a little focus on what baptism is all about. I always do a little talk. Don't worry, it's only going to be two or three minutes. Just to, to, to focus our minds on what we're actually doing here. Because out in the, the world of the church today, and in the world today, there are a lot of different ideas, and a lot of different versions, if we want to put it that way, interpretations of what we, we believe baptism to mean. But as Presbyterians, we we believe Scripture is very clear in what it teaches about baptism as a sign of God's covenant with his people. In the Old Testament, circumcision was the sign of God's blessing of salvation that was promised in the covenant that he made with Abraham. Of course, in the New Testament, then baptism becomes that, that sign of the new covenant and of salvation in Christ. It is a sign and a pledge that our lives are built on Christ and that he is our Lord and Savior. Of course, as Presbyterians, we believe that it is appropriate uh, for Christian parents to have their children baptized because of that covenant with Abraham and his children. 
We are God's covenant family today. And the sign of the covenant back then was given not only to Abraham who believed, but also to his children. And Jesus clearly said that he didn't come to do away with the law. He didn't come, come to do away with that old covenant. He came to fulfill that covenant. So we believe that in the New Testament, those promises of that covenant are not changed or, or removed in any sense, but they are reinforced uh, through Jesus. Baptism, of course, does not mean that, that the child will immediately become a Christian. In time, children must trust and believe in Jesus for themselves. The sacrament is a sign and seal of that covenant of grace which God has made with us through Christ. By baptism, our children are received into the covenant family of this visible church. You have been so good every week up to now. And now when you're center stage, you're letting everybody know you're here. When believing parents have their children baptized, of course... They are publicly declaring. <laughs> right, Catherine? You and me had words in the house the other night, didn't we? Says, where's my dummy? Give her. All right. And as if by magic... Any of you need a dummy down there? No? <laughs> well, only a couple of more minutes. Uh, when believing parents have their children baptized, uh, they are publicly declaring that they are committed Christians and that they want their child to come to know Jesus in a personal way and to grow up uh, to love and to serve him. The children of Christian parents, though they may not understand these things, are within the covenant and they do belong to the life of our visible church. So infant baptism, after having said all that, is given on the basis of the qualifications of the parents, not the child. It is the parents' relationship with God which is important. So what is required of parents is a credible profession of faith. That is a profession accompanied by an understanding of the Christian faith, a lifestyle in accordance with Christian values, and a public commitment to the worshipping Christian community. And since this child is not of an age to speak for herself, her parents, and you, the congregation, will make promises so that through Christian nurture and by the grace of God, she will come to profess her own faith and serve Christ in the church and in the world. Those vows that will be taken today are taken in the presence of God. And that's something I always want to remind folk about. We make our vows to God. David and Sarah and you as a congregation will make promises today to God. Not to me, the minister. Not to ourselves as the congregation, but to the Almighty God himself. And of course, that makes it paramount that we don't make those promises flippantly or carelessly. And today that is worth reminding ourselves of. Because as I've said, although the first two vows are primarily directed to you, David and Sarah, we will all make a promise and we all have made promises to God in the past. The first vow, parents are required to make uh, that profession of faith. The second uh, requires an undertaking to provide a Christian home for the child to bring them up in the worship and teaching of the church. And then that third vow that we've talked about is made by each and every one of us. We promise God that we will all behave in a particular manner to help this child grow in their knowledge of God. So this child will be surrounded by Christian example and influence. So in light of that, I'm going to read a short declaration that I normally do to remind us of what we're about to undertake in this sacrament. It's a reminder about the blessing of God being on those who take their vows with honesty and sincerity, but also the outcome of those who make promises lightly uh, and neglect uh, to to fulfill them. 
So as I say, even though this is primarily uh, directed to David and Sarah, you will all be making a vow to God, so it's, it's worth taking heed of. I solemnly charge you now, in the presence of God and of this congregation, that in answering these questions, you do so with honesty and sincerity. For be assured, the blessing of God only rests on those, upon those who so promise and then fulfill. Whereas the wrath of God is the portion of those who promise lightly or thoughtlessly and neglect to fill their solemn obligations to him. So this is something wonderful, but it is also something not to be taken lightly. So as we come to the vows, could we all stand together uh, as God's people uh, together? So firstly, uh, to David uh, and to Sarah, in presenting this child for baptism, do you profess your faith in God as your creator and father, in Jesus Christ as your Lord and saviour, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier and guide? And do you promise by God's help to provide a Christian home and to bring up this child in the worship and teaching of the church so that she may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour? And to you, the congregation, to everyone here, do you who now in Christ's name receive this child into this fellowship of the church promise with God's help so to order your congregational life and witness that she may grow up in the knowledge and love of God and be continuously surrounded by Christian example and influence. Amen. Now the scary bit. <laughs> yeah, it's good girl. Let me get you turned round. Oh, big stretch. <laughs> Catherine, Sarah Chambers, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This child is now received according to Christ's command into the membership of the Holy Universal and Apostolic Church and is engaged to be the Lord's. Let's sing the ironic blessing together. Oh, dear. Let's just pray together. Let's, let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you that in your infinite mercy and goodness, that you've not only promised to be our God, but the God and Father of our children. We thank you that you have received this child by baptism into the life of your church here today. Father, will you guard and guide Catherine all her days? May your love hold her. May your truth guide her. May your joy delight her. May she grow strong in body and mind and in your time come to faith in Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Father, make her home a place of safety and security. Help her parents, David and Sarah, to, to help her grow in your truth and to lead her in your ways. And Father, we pray for all the families in this congregation. May you be cherished in all our homes. May your presence in our midst transform our lives and may all our children grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus and we pray in his name Amen, Amen.
I'm going to sing the closing two verses uh, of our baptismal hymn. And whilst you do that, Catherine is going to go for a wee walk. I think it's a good thing to do to introduce uh, the, the child to the congregation. So you just make a wee bit of room. I'm going to go down that way while we sing, and then we'll come back up again. Let's sing the last two verses. O oh Lord, your infant feet were fine. Congregation can take a seat. Hey, our friend. And one of the, the promises we asked and what we talked about is, is nurturing our, our children in uh, the faith and bringing them up uh, knowing uh, God and, and knowing God's word. So it's always uh, my tradition, if I want to put it that way, that you get a little Bible. So this is Catherine's first, uh, it's maybe not her first Bible, but it's, it's a, a little Bible from me to, to help you. A little pink one too for, for a girl. Right, what are we going to do with you lot? Any birthdays? Any more birthdays this week? Uh, there's another birthday. What age are you? Eight. A big eight. Wish I was eight again. I don't really wish I was eight again, but <laughs> next one from the fox. When were you eight? Tomorrow. You're eight tomorrow? <gasps> wow, there you go. There we can all get a wee sweet from the sweetie man over there left his box again. There's even more on it since I was looking at it last night. Anybody want to be sweet and then you can go back to your seat. Everybody grab a wee sweet and then you go back to your seat. There we go. Wow. What about you, Catherine? <laughs> no, but early yet. If there's any children who didn't get a sweet, you can come, on, come afterwards and get, and get a sweet. We're going to continue uh, worshipping God as we uh, always do as we come uh, to our morning offering. So your morning offering uh, will now be received.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you once again for your goodness to us. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for each and every blessing which we have, which we know and acknowledge comes from you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and to bring this offering to you, Lord, just a token of what you have blessed us with. And Lord, we pray that you would use it mightily in this place uh, for your glory and the extension of your kingdom here and further afield. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. stand together again now and sing our next piece of praise coming up on your screen while humble shepherds watch their flocks in Bethlehem's plains by night let's stand and let's worship God together Let's just pray for a moment as we come uh, to God's Word. Father, we thank you as always for your Word to us. And Father, we thank you uh, for these stories of Christmas. But Lord, we know, uh, Lord, there is a greater meaning to it all. And we pray as we, as we look at this story of the shepherds today that you would speak to us very clearly. Lord, as always, let us hear your voice speaking to us, speaking directly into each of our hearts. 
And Lord, help us to respond to what you have said. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm sure most of us uh, have heard of, if we haven't seen uh, the film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, about the arrival of spaceships and, and aliens to Earth. Now, we're not going to have a discussion on spaceships and aliens. Uh, but in that film, uh, the, the main character played by Richard Dreyfus encounters one of these spaceships when he's out and about working to, to fix electricity problems that have arrived because uh, the aliens have come. And as the spaceship flies off, he decides to follow it. Uh, and from that point on, throughout the film, he is completely obsessed by these aliens. And there's this one image that haunts him almost at night, this one image that he just can't get out of his mind, this odd shape, this sort of mountain shape like a volcano. And he finally discovers that uh, this image is of a mountain called the Devil's Tower. And he has this irresistible urge uh, to go to this mountain. And well, it turns out that this urge uh, is a kind of a, a subconscious invitation from the aliens. It's an invitation to go and to meet with these aliens at the mountain. So off he goes and he does just that. He meets the aliens who have issued the invitation in the first place. Why are we talking about aliens and, and old movies? Well, in a way, wouldn't it be true to say that uh, 2,000 years ago, something like that plot in Spielberg's uh, fictitious film actually happened? It happened when another group of people received a special invitation to go and meet, well, a very different being, but a being, yes, who was beyond time and space. But the invitation that these men received led to a, a far more significant encounter than this one in the film. Because you see, their invitation wasn't from some alien people from another planet. It wasn't an invitation from space beings in a, in a, in a ship wasn't a close encounter of the third kind, it was a close encounter of the heavenly kind. Because the invitation came from the very God of the universe himself. And of course you know the group of people I'm referring to are the ones we read about and we've just sang about. The shepherds who were out on the mountainside in Bethlehem. And God's invitation to these men was to go and to meet his son Jesus the saviour of the world. And so I want us to think for a minute about this special invitation that these shepherds received because, well, we have received that same invitation of well, haven't we? We have all received an invitation to meet the saviour of the world. Yes, unlike the shepherds, we don't have angels to guide us, but we do have the Bible. And it's important that we accept this invitation. We accept this invitation to go and to meet Jesus because that is the true message of Christmas, isn't it? And it can be so easily lost in these days of celebration and so on. Although I think in spite of the secularism, secularism of, of Christmas, I think most people know they do know the real story. They do know the real meaning of Christmas. But maybe if truth be told, we've become too familiar with it. Some of it has become fable. Some of it has become legend. And we sometimes forget. We too easily forget who it was that arrived on our planet that night 2,000 years ago. I'm sure you've heard the story about the little girl who misquoted John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only forgotten son. And I think that kind of sums up the attitude of a lot of people in society today who love to celebrate Christmas. 
They love all that Christmas involves, but they have forgotten the Son at the heart of it. And so we need to remind ourselves constantly about this. And of course, one of the ways that helps us remember is through our Christmas carols, which are part of the celebration of the story of Jesus' birth. And so with that in mind, over the next number of services, over the next couple of weeks and in our services, alongside our scripture readings, we're going to use some carols to help us think about the story. That's why we read the story of the shepherds and we sung it a moment ago, while humble shepherds watch their flocks. But if you think about the lyrics that you've just sang of that, of that carol, they are a very literal paraphrase of Luke's account of Jesus' birth. They match the biblical narrative almost exactly, so it makes it one of the most biblically accurate carols we sing. So we have heard the story read. We have sung the narrative in our carol, but the question, as always, is what can we learn from this shepherd's story? Well, there's lots to learn from it, but you'll be glad to know I've only got three points today. Traditional good Presbyterian three points. You'll get the other three some other time. But the first, the first point that we can learn from this shepherd's story is that everyone is important to God. Everyone is important to God. Think about the story for a minute. Who were the ones to receive this personal invitation to be there on the night of Jesus' birth? The shepherds. Probably the most unlikely group to have received an invitation like this. They were despised, they were mistrusted by everyone for lots of different reasons. Looking after sheep was tw- literally a 24 7 kind of job. So they couldn't observe all the meticulous hand washing rules and regulations required by the religion. To make matters worse, it kept them away from the temple for weeks at a time. Made it nigh on impossible that they would be made clean in the eyes of the law. Since they were at the bottom of the, the ladder financially, they had a reputation for, for stealing and the like. Most people thought they were devious and dishonest. In fact, their reputation was so bad they weren't even allowed to give evidence in a court of law. Their word meant nothing. In most people's minds, shepherds in those days were like tramps and vagabonds and con men all rolled into one. They were looked down on as being part of the lowest of the lowest class of their culture. The only group lower than shepherds of that day were lepers. And yet God's invitation to meet Jesus was to those very men. And I believe one of the reasons God intentionally chose the shepherds was that so we would know that this good news is for everyone. Everyone is important to God regardless of their so-called standing in the world. God wanted to make sure that that we know that, that power and prestige, that privilege and position mean nothing when it comes to salvation and his love for us. I don't know how many people I have come across that, well, the words are, I'm not good enough. They don't think they're good enough for God. They're nobodies in their own minds. But listen, This story teaches us that no matter how insignificant you might think you are, that's not what God thinks. Everyone is important to God. Think back to to John 3.16. God so loved the world, and that world includes you, no matter who you are or where you are on the social standing. Everyone is important to God. That leads me to the second thing we're going to mention. The shepherd's experience reminds us that Jesus' birth signals wonderful news. It is good news. If you catch the angel's message as we read it and as we sang it, don't be afraid, they said at the start. 
No doubt they said that to help calm the shepherds down in a way. I'm sure they were absolutely terrified at the spectacle and the glory of of what they've just witnessed. Imagine you were there for a minute yourself. Out on the hills, minding your own business, and suddenly out of the darkness, this blinding light of an angel appears. Just as your eyes are beginning to adjust to that, your mind's beginning to deal with the fear that, that one angel has caused. Suddenly the whole sky is filled with a multitude of angels singing praise to God. I don't know about you, but if I'd been there, I'd have welcomed those four words. Don't be afraid. The wonderful news is that those words were meant to calm more than the anxiety of of just those shepherds. Those words are meant for us all. Because as we go through this life, we we're the seeing we have all we all have so much to be afraid of, don't we? We're afraid of illness. We're afraid of the future. We're afraid of death. The list could go on. We have this inbuilt fear and worry about things. The the angels say, don't be afraid. But the message the angels delivered that night to the shepherds is more than good news about not being worried, isn't it? It wasn't just don't be afraid. It was don't be afraid because the Savior has been born. The Savior has been born. So now we don't need to be afraid because if we have a relationship with him that drives away fear in the same way that light expels darkness. I think a good illustration would maybe be if you could think about a scene in a war movie. You know, when the good guys are surrounded by the bad guys and the good guys are afraid that if something doesn't happen, they're going to be overrun. They're in fear. Then the soundtrack changes. You know something's going to happen and sure enough, reinforcements come over the horizon and save the day. And in a very real sense, that's why I think it's a good illustration That's the situation all people were in before this night. That's the situation all people were in before Jesus came. That's the situation we're all in without Jesus. We all need rescued. Sin has surrounded us. Sin is defeating us, and we're all worried. We're all getting pushed farther and farther from God. We're lost people with no hope of being saved. But on that night, as the heavenly choir sings in the sky, changes the soundtrack, lets us know that something wonderful is about to happen. And of course it did. Rescue came. Because the Savior came. His sinless life and victorious resurrection made it possible for our sin to be defeated. Made it possible for our sins to be washed away. We don't need to fear life anymore. We don't need to fear death anymore because we can know real eternal security and peace when we put our faith in Jesus. And that's the last thing. I want us to think about today in this shepherd story. And I guess it's a really important bit uh, we can't miss out, uh, miss out on. When we put our faith in Jesus. The story, friends, highlights, shows us that what we do with the good news makes all the difference. What you do with this good news of the Savior coming into the world, makes all the difference. Put yourself in the shepherd's sandals for a minute or two. They could have doubted what they'd been taught. They could have ignored it. They could have rejected it. But they chose to believe it. They didn't say, let's go 
uh, to Bethlehem here and see, and see if those things are true. There was no doubt. They said, let's go and see this thing that has happened. They believed. And friends, the same applies to all of us in these days as well. It's not enough to hear the stories of Jesus. Unless you act on the angel's message. Unless you believe this angel's message. That the Savior has been born to save you. You're lost. And that's the danger of this Christmas time. We can get all sentimental about Christmas. We can have that warm, fuzzy feeling about it all when you hear the stories and you sing the carols. But if you don't believe and act on it, it means nothing. But if you do act on it, if you act on this good news, just like the shepherds did, if you reach out in faith, you will find that this Jesus is real. You'll see that that angel's message was true. You'll meet Jesus himself just as certainly as those shepherds did. Since that first night, those shepherds acted on the angel's invitation, millions and millions of people have responded to this invitation to meet with Jesus. Millions and millions have decided to believe the good news of the gospel and come to know God himself through faith and trust in this Savior who was born. And friend, if you haven't taken that step of faith yet, if you haven't decided to follow the Christ of Christmas, why not take a leaf out of the shepherd's book as we say? The invitation is here for you today to come and to meet Jesus. Act on that invitation today. Believe the truth that God loves you. Whoever you are. Just the way you are. Believe that Jesus' birth means wonderful news for you because you don't have to fear. Neither now nor in the eternity. Believe that Jesus is the one sent from God to rescue you from your sin. What will you do this Christmas, friends? Will you celebrate the forgotten son and be lost for eternity? Or will you come and meet Jesus and know the true joy of Christmas? God's invitation is here for you today. So will you come, my friend? Come and speak to me. Speak to one of the elders. But speak to us today. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much you sent your Son into this world to die for us. Father, we thank you that you love us in spite of who we are and you invite us to come to Jesus. You invite us to come to know or the wonder and joy of the real Christmas message, the wonder and joy of our relationship with Jesus. Father, we thank you for those of us who know Jesus today that we can celebrate that real joy. We pray that you would speak to those, Father, who don't yet know you, who haven't yet experienced that. Lord, we pray that you would stir their hearts and draw them to yourself. Lord, help them to act and to respond to this invitation to come to Jesus and to be saved. Father, we pray for us all. 
for as we begin this focus on Christmas. Lord, Lord, let us never forget your Son. Let us never forget what is at the heart of these celebrations. Jesus. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. So speak to us. Each one we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Apologies for my slideshow. I think I was a wee bit ahead of myself there. Uh, I'll get used to it someday. We're going to close our service singing our last piece of praise. If you were listening at the beginning of the service, uh, the praise group and Rebecca, thanks to them, led us in a, the, our last hymn. It's going to be Glorious Light, See the Dawn of Salvation. You'll have heard the tune and picked it up. It's a new one Mark has introduced to us, so... I'm not going to lead you. They're going to lead you. Uh, so if I can get this going right. There we are. Glorious lights see the dawn of salvation. Angels in white fill the skies with their wondrous song. Let's stand and let's worship God together. just pray uh, as we finish. We pray now that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would go with each of us now and forevermore. Amen.